Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nepalities Podcast. I'm excited to be here with Alex Denley to review the latest, the greatest New Polity Magazine, issue 5.1. Let's go. Let's do it. This was a great one. It's got an octopus on the uh, front cover. You know we're hitting our flow state when we start drawing octopuses, or at least stealing images from the past to make our magazine look pretty. And this magazine actually, as I was rereading it for this, does have a great thematic content of, um, of totalitarianism, tyranny, and how to avoid them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Totally. Seems like the basic idea. And this is one of the most basic ideas I got actually from New Polity's conference, which we're just coming off the, uh, the fumes of. Uh, that's, not a, that's not a phrase. But um, New Polity's conference on technology, where we kept on coming up with this idea that without a good, without a notion of the good, without a socially articulated notion of what we're doing here and what we're for and what a person is and what the fulfillment of human nature looks like, we're open to this indefinite suggestion. I think the idea that the American liberals had was very optimistic. It's that, yeah, we're going to all strive to attain our own ends, but basically our ends will always be good. And the founders of America said, that you know, some people will quote this as evidence that they were really Christians, where they said, "Okay, we have this new experiment in politics, this this constitutional republic, but it will only work as long as we retain our Christianity." Mm-hmm. Um, but what we've found is that actually, when you deprive people of a socially articulated um, public display of what is good and what we're for. Um, things fill that place. Like they, yep. they, we start to go after other things. You um, can leave your political order open ended yeah. if it's presumed you have Christian ends already. It, it was their yeah. presumption, right? Yeah. We can have a liberal political order. We can leave it open. We're still Christian. Yeah, but now we're not. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, and so now we're this. We're this. We've been working really hard for hundreds of years to habituate ourselves to being indefinitely open to suggestion. And then surprise, surprise, we live in a technocratic regime that operates on suggestion, like operates on getting people to think things, getting people to buy things, getting people to do things. Um, And that presumes people as this sort of fluid, malleable, influenceable, unfixed, unmoored idea in whom desires can be created and taken away um, with the proper techniques of, of Technology, marketing, mm-hmm. propaganda. There's real like, you know, law is teacher. It's mm-hmm. kind of, okay, so we assumed everyone is, uh, can determine their own ends. Yeah. But then we find that the lack of determinancy itself becomes the basis of the person's, the sovereign individualism. Totally, it's like, yeah, okay, yeah. we've, we, we presumed it was a Christian people that we could let yeah. them do their thing, but eventually they became like the law itself and kind of indifferent and, you know, skipping ahead to Schindler's article, which is fantastic, yeah. and he's dealing with uh, Hannah Arendt, mm-hmm. uh, Arendt, as Waldstein told me. Yes. Uh, America and the Inversion of Tyranny by D.C. Schindler. Yeah. Yeah. The way Arendt uh, s- starts off, how do we get to totalitarianism, is the isolated individual, mm-hmm. or what she says that certain social structures that basically gave you meaning in society as those start to fade away and it just becomes the masses is her term Mm -hmm. where we're all individuals all of us are participating in the market or all of us participating in the state just as individuals um the political order has radically changed and it's it's not like older forms yeah um you you can start to talk about the nation as a whole as as one group Mm -hmm. with different classes and we're we're in a so to bring this back to liberalism uh we have this kind of neutral end political ordering of a christian people but becoming like that neutral ended open-ended liberalism we just become sovereign individuals yeah it's wild that we thought we could have as the political ideal the empty container uh, and then we will just stuff that with Christian soup. But then uh, turns out we now aspire as an ideal to being an empty container. So it's like we're trying to fill the empty container with an empty container. Mm-hmm. You see this with the with um, transgenderism in some ways as it progressed from transsexualism um, as a sort of idea that well the the person is essentially extrinsic from their sexuality, um, but 
but can have like the definite content of being a man or being a woman and attempt to form themselves in the image of that definite content. Well, that became basically passe. And now it's actually the very form of neutrality that we're attempting to imitate in our sexual culture and our sexual aesthetic. So androgyny and basically the, the a, asexual, agender, um, uh, gray sexual uh, milieu becomes the actual ideal. So that so that what I'm what I'm saying is that that idea of neutrality that you're an individual, you get to determine your own end, the the meaning of your own existence takes on a definite form. It's not just this neutral thing that precedes you picking something to be, picking something to go for, picking something to do. Mm-hmm. It actually becomes uh, in man it it becomes the object of our search, the object of our restlessness, our search for meaning. And so we attempt to become, it's, it's very, uh, quaint almost like we become what our parents tell us is good. Mm -hmm. Like dad tells us, you know, that we are individuals who have anything is possible. And so we attempt to make ourselves look like undeterminate individuals for whom anything is possible. And, What's the irony being that that's one of the most determinate things you can do to Mm -hmm. a body, to a sexual body is to um, form it in the shape of an androgen. It takes great technological uh, intervention to do so. It takes work. Yeah. It takes a lot of work to get there. Yeah. And it's not just in in terms of, in terms of sex, it's, it's in terms of like our jobs, in terms of the market. Like we thought that um, we could have this free market, indeterminate ends, you choose choose your player, uh, Mm -hmm. choose your own adventure. And we would just fill that thing with good Christian content. That empty form was going to, was going to have people getting out there to, to do good in the world through, uh, succeeding within a market system. Of course, what actually happens is people just try to make tons of money Mm -hmm. and, and, and money without relation to, to how or to what, or to, to the common good. But the very marker of sort of neutral success like, I mean, the very marker of just success for success's sake uh, becomes the goal of most people. Like, what do you want to do within this market economy? I want to make a bunch of money. So, again, what's posited as simply the neutral state that we can all choose our particular ends becomes inverted and becomes the actual goal. So the actual goal is just having a bunch of neutral power that is indeterminate towards particular ends, a.k.a. having a bunch of money. Yeah. The goal is an androgynous presentation that's always extrinsic to the particular of sex, the givenness of sex. Um, that That's no longer the kind of uh, proceeding state out of which we identify as man mm-hmm. or woman. That is now the actual object of our sexual identification. Totally. Again and again, neutrality becomes... Uh, uh, the object of our of our desire. I mean, the the Bible knows about this. It always when it talks about idols, it always says you will become like what you worship. And we th- it seems to me like you could describe America, you know, especially after reading this this essay by Schindler, as this idea that we wouldn't become that because we didn't define it. Mm-hmm. It's like no, no, no. We're not going to become individuals. We're not going to become people who are without a particular end in mind. Um, we are going to be essentially Christians acting out of this big, empty freedom that America totally. maintains. And neutrality is terrifying sure. for the for the individual. So that's where rent goes with it. But it it's because there's no there's no actually there's no real there's no real of the self and identity. There's no you've posited yourself as neutral to end so you could be anything Mm -hmm. but there's also no idea that you could reach some final state that there's some that there's some definitiveness and reality there and what Arendt describes is that terror becomes the um an interior terror that you are not who you you're not actually a real existing person within a social structure that understands you that makes sense of you and that despite all your actions, you will still remain the neutrality yeah. thing. Like, no, but now show. you get more money, but now you're just wealthier, but there's wealthier people out there, that, you know, besides you. There's yeah, Schindler, people more Schindler, powerful. Yeah, Schindler brings us out where, you know, in a, in a call it a traditional tyranny or traditional totalitarianism. Um, I think he starts calling it classical totalitarianism at some point. Um, 
terror operates to sever you from from your ends like it's it's literal it's brutal it's violent it's the secret police showing up at the door and the thing that you posited as your end you cannot do because there's the threat of violence against you um so what's like very very ironic about the the um enlightenment project the american project is that it begins where classical totalitarianism ends it says um it says that your ends are always open and nebulous and can be changed um and anything you do choose as your particular end is really just your particular individual choice insofar as it coheres within the present order so in dc schindler's essay he's talking about arendt's concept of terror um it says that terror, as Arendt understands it, is something fundamentally different from fear, insofar as fear has a specific identifiable object, namely the lawless and violent tyrant who seeks to impose his own will on others. What distinguishes terror is that it has no such object. It designates a pervasive sense of threat, which can emerge at any moment from any quarter. It is a more, it is more a general atmosphere than a discrete experience. Terror is the soul's response to a threat that has no centralized source. Of particular importance for us is that Arendt infers from this lack of an identifiable object the claim that terror affects its control ultimately through a kind of self-coercion. So the irony about this is that in contrast to what Schindler talks about as classical totalitarianism, um, there's a kind of pre-existing state of terror in liberalism understood generally, which is that because you are constrained from um, having a ultimate good as your end within liberalism. This is the great pox liberalis. Um, because you're constrained from having any ultimate end, then you have for any particular end, for any particular good, it's always within this um, threat from nowhere of being changed, of being not the the thing of you, you always are to keep your options open. You're always to avoid, uh, you know, having your opinion be, um, you know, believed to be fact by another person. You're always removed as it were from yourself. Um, mm -hmm. and this is a really pleasant experience compared to the, the totalitarianism of a tyrant imposing his will and the, uh, totalitarianism of, of a, um, you know, a secret police state, mm -hmm. but you all... maintain a kind of distance from blame by doing that yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, well, I can't be blamed for anything because it wasn't really me. It was kind of, you know, I'm trying to be this anonymous self. You never actually make definitive opinion. Yeah. You never actually say, this is what I stand for, or what I believe, which is, you know, you read as a tool of power, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you read like Havel's, um, the green grocer essay, which I always just think of as the green grocer essay, but uh, Victor Havel's uh, the Power of the Powerless, I think it's called. Um, and y you have, as an effect of the totalitarian communist regime, this sort of disidentification with anything you say and it really meaning something, right? So you, you announce your allegiance to the party with a sign on the window, but you don't have any, you don't believe what the sign says. It's just become a mere signal of, I'm on oh, board yeah. with the present order, don't hurt me. That's <laughs> yeah. that sort of what it means. But obviously you see parallels of that in American society. Um, it's just that that idea of don't make any definitive statements beyond affirming the present neutral order as mm -hmm. as good. Um, it's just baked into the whole. Oh, yeah. And you can keep project. an ironic distance. Another thing Arendt talks about is that gullibility and cynicism go together mm. in these type of regimes. Mm -hmm. So when you're an isolated individual who's neutral to ends, can be do, doing anything, you're within a totalitarian you know structure, you can be cynical of everything. You can say, yeah, it's like, you know, the, the Soviets doing all the, yeah. their stuff. Oh, I might be taken by the secret police today. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, because you don't actually have social structures around you that, that provide a coherent world, you're gullible for anything the party says. Mm -hmm. You can be like, well, yeah, no one actually believes the Soviets are the end point of all of history and all this stuff. But then the Soviets actually say something and you're like, no, that's exactly it. Like, yeah. it, it's because you don't have others who have a definite uh, position and thereby world to judge things. Yeah. You don't have others to judge things and you yourself are like no longer 
uh, judging right or wrong on your own terms, you're kind of quashing conscience that you are actually extremely gullible. Mm. Someone can just come along and say, I will solve all of your problems. And you're like, that's the guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is definitely a characteristic of a technocratic regime that we're all cynical and we're all gullible. I mean, if you look online, it's like both the age where everyone has has knowledge, like they all know the 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 way that you speak online is as one who has all of the information available at his fingertips and knows to ask, you know, for a fact check and knows about uh, making sure you cite your sources and have expert opinion, et cetera, and is the same person who will believe the most ludicrous theory <laughs> as it comes up, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, it does seem to be just the lack of anything within our society that says, believe this, not that, love this, not that. Mm -hmm as a um as a definite claim which is why schindler ultimately says that you know you can reduce totalitarianism to the separation of politics from the church um that is a bold claim but i think it's quite right it's like when we say there is no authority on earth um then we say every man for himself. And when we say every man for himself, we're basically breaking people down into the discrete units that can be built up again into um, totalitarian regimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It ends up being all about power and not authority, right? Which, uh, you know, Schindler's been discussing and I think he discusses in politics, the real and, and, and here as well, but that authority has a recognition of a reality of a social hierarchy that there are those in power as present to you as authority that their power is meant for some purpose yeah like we couldn't imagine dressing up a king in you know fancy robes and having him parade through the streets but we'll parade our our missiles mm -hmm. you know like we'll we'll parade the technology mm -hmm. um and it's because you don't actually need honor in in an isolated individualized thing. You don't actually need there to be honorable authorities that are present that you can demand their power mm. where you say you have to use your power for the good. You present yourself as authority. But now it's just uh, in the state structure, everyone's just a, a bureaucrat. Everyone is, 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 it's basically just power that, that you lose authority at every, at, at every level. Yeah. The power is not aimed towards the power of those above you is not aimed towards your good and they don't even make the appearance of it. Yeah. Yeah. And any kind of, um, yeah. And it's defended precisely as maintaining everyone's freedom, right? Where everyone who is above us isn't going to tell us what to do. And everyone who's above us isn't going to tell us what to think or to tell us what to believe. Um, don't worry. We're safe from that, but it is going to tell us, that we're going to war with Iraq or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, you know, a, uh, the essay is pessimistic. Uh, Schindler's essay is uh, a little dark, but I think it also, again, just shows the, the vital importance of um, not just having the ultimate good, which is attained uh, through focusing our eyes on Christ, but even proximate goods um, held onto with, with real subjective passion um, is a stumbling block to the age um, mm -hmm. to develop a particular skill, to become a particular kind of person, to live in a particular place um, and to resist being broken down into just a mobile unit that's open to suggestion from anywhere um, is going to be the basis. It's like the, the basic form of human development by which Christian communities can be built up um, that ultimately will will win. I totally. Think. I mean, Arendt ends on a positive note after describing Hitler and Stalin's regimes yeah. of totalitarianism with every new birth is a new possibility. Mm -hmm. That's how she ends this like magnum opus of, you know, from history of anti-Semitism to imperialism to totalitarianism yeah. with like every birth is a new promise. And I think people can listen to new polity or read new polity and think, man, these guys must be deep pessimists and like think everything's terrible and is American totalitarianism. Uh, but really the purpose is to show that, and I, I think Schindler's showing it here, 
what Arendt shows is that the isolation of liberalism, the masses that that happened, the the breaking of people into different, uh, you know, that are just controllable by power. Well, when you start to actually make social structures that people love each other and can resist it, like you, you're already turning back the logic of the isolation. So actually, it's extremely positive. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you love your friends, you love your family, you're building up your community. You're you're not only resisting it, but overturning it. Yeah. Like, it's not as though if all of us in America, like, actually had a, if we were the church, if yeah. we actually believed we were saved, trying to live virtuously, took salvation seriously and the faith seriously, then it would, it would total, it would destroy the, like, the totalitarian regime of America that wouldn't be around anymore because we're all friends now. <laughs> like we all believe that. And yeah. yeah. And, and simply having a definite, I mean, it's, it seems so sad sometimes when you ask, okay, so what's like your political stance? I'm like, I think everyone should have some definite goal. I mean, it sounds like, <laughs> <laughs> like self-help or something. Uh, but I do, I think that the mere fact of, becoming a particular person and drawing a line as to who you are and where you are and what you do um, is itself um, resistance to this particular form of totalitarianism. Schindler ends with, you know, a, a um, diagnosis, but then a hope for a cure. A regime is not so much a tyranny as its mere image. Something like an inversion of tyranny, a tyranny without a tyrant, perhaps an infinity of tyrannies, but not governed by individuals seeking to subvert the common good and subordinate it to their will. Instead, we have become an embodied contradiction, tyrants without a will, those who just as often subordinate our own interest to the common good as the common good to our own interest, because we have lost contact with the good altogether, which is the source of all interest. We love neither the common nor the particular insofar as we no longer sustain our lives from an indissoluble bond with reality. If this is the case, then our resistance has to begin with a recollection of politics in its original purpose, the formation of order, open, above and below, that arises from a recovery of the relationship to reality, our relationship to reality, and all of its created goodness, truth, and beauty at the foundation of human community. Um, and I think that's quite right. It also strikes me, you know, we began this discussion in regards to the technology conference that as with many uh, conferences, I always end up more sympathetic to the thing that we're attacking by the end. So I'm a big AI fan now, actually, uh, because I was talking with some guys who came to the conference because they were um, working on various AI development teams. And then the military was basically like, hey, thanks for doing this. We're taking over now. And so uh, some quit. And they were saying that, you know, one of the problems with AI is that it feeds on itself. Um, so as AI produces more of the content on which AI trains, there's this positive feedback loop of, of absurdity where things become bizarre hallucinations, the term they use. Um, and, and I think this is great because what it means is if we, there's a, there's a possible route that we could all take where we just accelerate the use of AI uh, to deliberately create a completely absurd cosmos, but as quickly as possible so that it's still in relationship to a real order that we still have a lingering connection to. The point being that if you just make, like they were describing how basically all of the effort of AI creation has been to keep 4chan from being the oh. thing that just <laughs> proliferates indefinitely through through generative AI. And it's like, well, but what if what if we didn't? And then the entire online existence, which is the sort of source of you know, the the surveillance capitalism of the age, just became the most horrendous weirdo place to go and to spend time in the world. Um, it might make the choice more clear. For people. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is kind of acceleration to collapse. You yeah, know? yeah. I mean, not even just collapse. It's like, look, if the internet right now is basically a place where you still get to indulge the illusion that um, it's not a giant mechanism of control, but it's somewhere that you can go just to live out real world goods, but through this tool yeah, that makes you more it. powerful. Yeah. yeah. 
it's like, okay, sure. But what if every time you go there, there's like people with three eyes just like on your screen? Like you can't go there without this just like flood of AI generated absurdity that oh, yeah, seems yeah. to be, uh, yeah, it just might make the choice between the two cities clear. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm not. Well, I commit- definitely get offline. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, you don't want to be there with the 4chan bot. Yeah, yeah. just like spewing endless. Uh, you know, I don't know. Twitter already depravity. seems that way. But well, yeah. no, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. That's a good point. Get off of Twitter. So, anyways, um, that's the that was the academic essay of the of this particular uh, magazine, and and I think it. Um, it's really good. I mean, Schindler's always incredible when he graces our pages. Uh, we also published uh, two pieces from the tradition. So one was from uh, Balthazar, uh, Hans Urs Vaughn, and it is a great little play <laughs> that he wrote in the middle of a book um, that in English is called The Moment of Christian Witness. And I thought it was marvelous. The reason we republished it is it's a discussion between a Christian and a, and a Soviet, uh, uh, what is he called? Commissar. Commissar. Yeah. He's basically deciding whether to liquidate the Christians or not. And he, um, determines at the end that he doesn't need to liquidate the Christians because they're busy liquidating themselves. <laughs> so it's this marvelous critique of, uh, again, sort of Balthazar's time, but a marvelous critique of like the open endedness of Christianity as it becomes, um, a tool to other ends besides itself. So when Christianity loses its mystical dimension, when it no longer is really about Jesus Christ, the son of God who has become man and revealed himself particularly, but becomes a sort of means for attaining peace and progress and uh, higher consciousness of morality and such. Um, then it, already becomes instrumentalized to other Mm -hmm. regime forms. It no longer declares its own form as the one and says we should be Christian thoroughly, entirely, politics, economics, everything. Instead, it subordinates itself and says, hey, Christianity is really useful to a regime of freedom. It's really quite good to have people habituated in this way if you want a smoothly functioning market economy where you can basically trust other people. It's, you know, all, we do this all the time because we totally. always feel like we have to sell Christianity in, according to the present regime. It's never radical, it's always incidental. Mm-hmm. And when we do it, the, the commissar in this story is pleased because it means he doesn't have to bother killing the Christians because we're busy in this project of asserting that we are not a threat, Mm -hmm. that we will simply help the present order continue itself, which seems to have been the project of unfortunately so much Christian theology in the 20th century. From the perspective of the regime, they can only see in terms of threat, non-threat, within yeah. their mode of power. Yeah, they don't care like what you it, believe. Like <laughs> It's either there's this theocratic fascist movement trying to take over our state and yeah. we have to crush it, yep. or they're just in the background, another one of the warring, you know, whoa, well, we're just, you know, supporting the liberal order and regime. It makes me think about, uh, about Justin Martyr's apology to, uh, not apology, defense, yes. you know, apologia, to the emperors during his time. He wrote two to the Roman empires, uh, emperors in the early church, because it is both a defense of don't kill the Christians. We're not a threat, but like implicitly we're a threat because we're a threat to the mode of power of the Roman empire in that we're asserting Christ is King. And this mode of power that we have as Christians is actually the love of one another and the salvific power of the cross, yeah. which means that, uh, your power will, what we're hoping is that power will be converted to this, to, to Christianity. Yeah, and Justin right? Martyr, uh, and it's the same in, in the epistles of Paul, rearticulates the authority of temporal rulers as coming from God. Um, and so as being under judgment and not simply being under judgment, but also being authority in the strict sense where it is uh, uh, standing for a good that exceeds and proceed, uh, pre- precedes um, the particular temporal ruler. Uh, it's like saying to a to a would be god, 
you know, actually we're all uh, aiming in the same direction and you are leading us towards a common goal. Not you are setting the goal, not that you are imposing a, a will, not that you are ordering society, but mm. that you exist. I mean, th- this is, uh, you know, in, in the words of Christ that um, those who would be above must become the servants of all. That inversion of, of worldly power is what Christianity always does. It, it looks at the highest person and says, precisely by virtue of your elevated status, you are the um, lowest servant. Mm. Like you have the most responsibility for attaining the good for others. And wherever Christianity does this, it's, I mean, it's its the radical act. It's the transvaluation of values. Uh, and, totally. I, and I think that, um, and that can get missed because you can read the early church and think of the admittedly practical, like stop killing us arguments as having no radical uh, mm-hmm. bent. But I think they, I think they obviously did. I mean, they, they, what's, I mean, the proof is in history. They, they worked out of that pagan idea in which man is Lord over man. We destroyed that whole thing mm-hmm. and, and moved into a, a radically different form of politics, which is exemplified um, for us anyways in the Middle Ages. Although Balthazar of all people is going to be the first to say that the Middle Ages are just a very youthful uh, attempt. That uh, brings me to Christopher Dawson's essay, which is the other one. I mean, he he is um, he is a historian of very broad strokes in this yeah. particular essay. So I'm not going to try to do what he does. Read it, enjoy it. But two things that I'd like to point out um, was were um, that idea that when in the 17th century, especially, you have a sort of definitive break from the old order, um, from the Catholic Church, and the new nations of Europe are. Uh, come of age as as things independent of some unifying tradition in which they all belong. Um, then he makes a con- kind of consistent argument that the present that power, the present society, becomes its own justification. So it needs no further thing, which was always the authority of the church, to justify its power. Um, so he says the course of history as he sort of draws it out is that um, with three basic factors, the economic and political changes of the 15th and 16th century, the rise of the national monarchies um, and the discovery of the new world and also the um, the change in the conception and then reason for science uh, that happens around the same period. It says the result of all this was an age of expansion and self-consciousness. Man felt himself to be of age and gloried in the hitherto unrealized possibilities of his powers and knowledge. He grew impatient of restraint, irreverent towards authority, wishing to prove and to see all things. Hence the temper of humanism, man entering into his kingdom and turning his eyes away from faith and the supernatural. Hence a reaction from the secular medieval tradition, each nation and race standing on its own ground and vindicating its independence against the rest of Christendom. And the comes to a head, he says, in the Counter-Reformation after the death of Louis the Fourteenth, the Counter-Reformation finally collapsed. The destruction of the Jesuits made it patent to all. It's in the 18th century that the modern world began. The great state becomes all-powerful. It will brook no limits to its authority in religion or in any other matter. It will recognize no end but its own advantage. And that, I think, is really the theme within the whole Dawson essay, is that once you get rid of a transcendent goal, the existence of the state itself becomes the ultimate goal, becomes mm-hmm. the transcendent goal. But it has no real content outside of its own survival. So this it, it, this brings up the whole discussion of, of liberalism that we just had, which is um, it's not a, a government 
leading a people towards a good that they all recognize. It's the continued existence, almost animal-like continued existence. Survival of the state itself becomes the goal. And so what happens is increasingly the good life is just judged as being one that is fit to the present state of affairs. Totally. Um, and I think it brings up, you know, Schindler brings up uh, Foucault and Agamben on biopolitics yeah. in his essay, but it becomes biopolitical and disciplinary. So the modern state, if it views itself as its own end, the health of the nation, this type of thing, it then becomes concerned with population, yeah. with health, with eugenics, yep. with making all of the 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 disciplinary means by which the nation can maintain itself, grow stronger, be healthier. So, so there's also a very important like scientific shift that's happening at this time. Yeah. Um, yeah. The once you treat the state as the goal, then then the uh, primary concern is is uh, maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, and this disappears or, or destroys any. Uh, over time, uh, any remnant of a, of, a, of a genuinely supernatural end. So religion becomes privatized rather famous, famously, but you can see it even in, in our own time that the kinds of religions that thrive and survive are ones that effectively work as therapeutic forces for the maintenance of the state. So he talks about this, especially in regards to, Dawson speaks about this, especially in regards to English Protestantism. Um, so he's speaking about the um, post-industrial scene amidst this growing materialism of social life. English Protestantism had made gallant efforts to retain or revive some form of Christianity, but as they could make no effort to convert society and to inspire it with their own spirit, all their efforts were doomed to failure. Wesley himself in later life confessed the impossibility of keeping his converts from the spirit of the world. The Methodist he describes, whose regularity of life and probity were helps to money-making, was a common character in the England of the 18th and 17th centuries. Consequently, Protestantism tended more and more to make men conscientious, conscientious members of the existing society, good citizens, and the supernatural character of religion gradually disappeared. Uh, English liberalism, which itself owed a great deal to Protestantism, became in the 19th century the characteristic mode of thought of industrial England. It was marked by an entire faith in the indefinite progress of material prosperity by indus industry and trade, and in the complete satisfactoriness of this progress as the aim of human society and the last end of man. Uh, yeah, if you read that in partnership with uh, the Balthazar essay, you basically get the whole critique that Christianity becomes redescribed as being acceptable insofar as it serves the ends of maintenance of the state. And then gradually over time, the ones that don't quite serve this, uh, the religious expressions that don't quite serve this become um, phased out, as it were. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's easy. Yeah, yeah, religion becomes an aid to industriousness. Yeah. It's the industrious man who you know, sits in church on the Sunday, yeah, but is right. looking forward to his Monday when yeah. he's back in the office, you know? <laughs> yeah, we all do this. I mean, this is just, there's a reason that the church is always uh, threatened by worldliness as its counterpart. It's not, worldliness is not just like some sin among, among many. It is the temptation is to become like the world. Um, and the world doesn't have the end of God and of holiness. It it just has itself. It's it's the closed ceiling. It's the mirror of self reflection. And uh, when the church becomes like the world, it really becomes like the world. Mm. It becomes it takes its ends as its own. So in America right now, we have all sorts of things in in the church that are, uh, I think taking the basic maintenance of the present order as the real help of the church. So the, you know, I think about this every time that you, yeah, I mean, Christianity can make you a healthier person because it will probably get you to stop smoking and drinking so much. And being a healthier person means that you can save some money on insurance and just generally become less of insurance liability. And we and we can use these our Christianity for these these other ends. Um, I mean, that's basically the whole 
neoconservative project is that you know Christianity is is very helpful to you know stable democratic regimes within a within a um, modern era mm-hmm. uh, and it provides a basis for your distaste to the progressives like it it is mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. is you know it, it maintains well I'm still Christian so I think the progressives and what they're doing are are bad and wrong yeah. but it it's almost like inverting you brought up Romans like Romans 13 when mm-hmm. the recommendation to the Christians there is also be good citizens yeah like but it's not you're good citizens so probably come to church on occasion yeah, yeah, right yeah. like it's <laughs> yeah. it's it's not that when you make your religion in the service of when you make Christianity in service of just being a good you know a good American citizen or something like yeah. that we're a help to the the capitalist order or we're a help to the state or you know we, we would obey orders and stuff what you're what you're saying is that the 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 ceiling of your Christianity is underneath the ceiling of the state yeah. or underneath the ceiling of the market whereas for Paul it's like the revelation is opening up to the whole of history into God into ultimately into eternity living eternal life even now yeah. and because of that you should still do the good of the authority but be working for the conversion of his power towards uh, truth towards yeah. revelation yeah and once you've cut that off once you've limited your ceiling you're 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 just a state like uh, another subordinate actor under uh, totally. the regime. And, and that doesn't even need to be posited as something that might happen. I, it already has. So like we are not Christian now. I mean, largely speaking, people are not identifying with Christianity. And I think the last real hurrah that uh, mirrors what Christopher Dawson described would be the cold war where you have state goals that are very strong. We're going to beat the communists. One of the ways we beat the communists is by being good Christians, unlike those godless, atheistic, hedonistic, you know, reds. Russians. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Russians. Uh, and, and you can see this like great rise in religiosity that probably would mirror exactly what Dawson is describing in terms of the rise in uh, Methodism and, and Protestantism that takes the basic spirit of the age, which was money making, and then praises the particular virtues that can be a help to money making as the form of Christianity, uh, or like the as the ideal form of Christianity. Um, and as, but what happens is once that subordination is made, especially in in as we go through generations of mothers and fathers um, passing passing Christianity down to their children, we lose the faith because faith is faith in the supernatural. Mm-hmm. And if not in the help to the natural, <laughs> like if you even get the inkling as a kid that the reason that your dad is Christian is because he hates the communists, then you might as well just hate the communists. Yeah. Why, like, why do the extra stuff? Like, and it's actually an honor to your father to just hate the communists because you're seeing what motivates him most. And you're trying to imitate him in, in like the deepest part of his being. You're not trying to identify ultimately like a healthy child in relation to his father or mother doesn't identify them with them like particularly that would be kind of horrifying if you became this little clone of your parents but what you do is you see in your parent what they really love and what they really care about and if uh yeah if and this is this is a great worry i have with the with with the with the trads these days it's like if we become christian and own the libs that's great we're going to do great for a generation but if our children see us doing it and 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 can tell because they're 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 clever they'll sniff it out they can tell that we're our piety is really just we're hoping to at some level post it and anger the mm-hmm. the non-christian left or whatever it is they'll know it and actually there's ways to make the non-christian left way more mad than going to church uh mm-hmm. and, and so i i think you have this common theme throughout this whole magazine, which is like Christianity for any other end than the supernatural is not just a Christianity operating at 80%. It is Christianity going the other way. Mm -hmm. And that's Dawson's history of the modern world is, is the loss of the Catholic church meant the separation of politics uh, from the transcendent. And so it became a self-reflective imminent orders where you can have Christianity within a particular regime, but ultimately only insofar as it serves it. Serves it. And then over time, people start to actually live more realistically and just, just become members of the regime first. And 
Christianity loses. That is sad, but <laughs> there it is. No, and, and in that model, I think the best you can get is a kind of Eastern Cicero papism, which I don't know. This is right, you know, the integralists really aren't, no one talks about it anymore. But yeah, uh, yeah I think you defeated Vermeule. Uh, in your paper, <laughs> I don't know. but uh, Daddy, you know, Daddy, like Daddy the so. reason they talk about the Byzantine Empire a lot is if you're going to make the church subordinate to the regime, the best you can do is have them like officially recognize it and just, you know, uh, like you can kind of wag your finger at them on occasion, you know, mm-hmm. but if, if, if Christianity really is revolutionary, then it's every mode of power within society should be oriented towards that final end. And I think that's what Schindler you know, is brilliantly arguing in politics of the real, the the transformation of all aspects of the social order, all aspects of how power is wielded, like that is that grand vision that's that I think, you know, is partly presented here and and what's trying to trying to be articulated is how do we get to that? And and you can't take even the like Cesaro Papist confessional state, um in point in which the church even is the most recognized mm. power or something yeah, like yeah. like the church has to be the the real the the social order itself yeah. is to view yourself as the body of christ yeah and that's why it is never without the cross i mean it's not i shouldn't say it's why it's never without the cross but the the cross is always that contradiction because within any christianity that serves the regime ultimately it doesn't need the cross because it comes to uh a point of synchronicity and comfort with the existing power structure that offers its rewards and punishments. Um, so basically for, for most time, and I think it's still to some extent today, like to be a Christian will within a certain way will allow you the rewards of the regime. Um, the cross becomes something Jesus suffered for us and it becomes something that we use to, to get through the difficult moments of life as it were, but as the actual form of God in the world, it, it, it loses its necessity. Um, now there's places in life now where, where it starts to, where faithfulness starts to reveal that there is a crucifixion for us, that there is a non-identity between the goals of the world and of uh, the goals of God and that there is going to be suffering um, for us, but I think you can be rightly suspicious whenever a Christian movement uh, presents itself as being, you know, without suffering, or mm-hmm. ultimately even as its goal. This like, yeah, we're gonna have total victory on earth. It's like, no, yeah, yeah. you're gonna have the cross. <laughs> yeah. um, so I wrote one that's up next after Dawson. Uh, why we can't have sanctuary. Uh, and I had a lot of fun writing this. Oh, it was really good. We don't need to talk about it too much because yeah. it's it's there. I wrote it. You can read it. Uh, the basic argument came from just reading a bunch of texts and realizing that if we had sanctuary in our societies, uh, they, the whole society would explode. I mean, it, it would just be an entirely different social order. Um, but this really was... Christianity. It was the expectation of Christianity um, and Christian society that a criminal would have recourse to sanctuary, to arrive at a church and be protected from corporal uh, and capital punishment by by arriving at that church, and also to receive intercession from the church to whatever avengers or legal pursuants were mm. on his tail. Um, I was trying to imagine doing that, like, you know, a fellow crack addict robs the liquor store and gets to, you know, holy family or something. And <laughs> the cops are like, stay outside. I mean, there's just yeah. unthinkable. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and the basic argument that I was trying to make is that to have something like sanctuary, you have to have a common goal for your society. Because sanctuary relies on, it's not illogical, it's not irrational. It's the result, it's a political result of faith. Because faith says that there is some one thing that we are all 
about. There is one faith and one baptism and one goal. And that we belong to one family that's progressing towards God. And you can rebel against it. And you can also reconcile to it. But the point is that it's there. It's there to be rebelled against. It's there to be reconciled to. The church was that goal. The church is humanity redeemed. And so the church is uh, to touch them, to to subordinate yourself to their laws, too, because uh, to run to sanctuary meant to run to confession, which meant to receive a penance from the church, which... You know, it wasn't just three Hail Marys. It could be pretty significant. Um, to run to the church was not just to, you know, to find like a, a base where you're safe. Uh, it, it was to declare allegiance to the common good, to say, I am a part of the thing that we're all about. Um, and, and this is why you have sanctuary wherever you have that common good articulated. So in my essay, I use the family as the big example, because a family has a certain peace that they all want. You want the peace of the family. You want the good of the family. It's articulated. It has authorities who represent it. Then when a child who is in trouble flees to his mother and asks for mercy, the basic principles of sanctuary are in play because you want the ultimately the goal of punishment is can only be to reconcile the um uh, the rebel to back to the common good of the family and so if the child is of its own accord uh seeking or saying i subordinate myself to the coming of the family i'm sorry have mercy on me uh then punishment becomes a little uncouth it's like why would mm-hmm. you why would you punish someone who's already attained in their heart what Punishment can only kind of hope to attain through through a certain uh, administration of coercion. Uh, totally, and and also the church and war can't be sieged. Like you'll also have like armies who will you know let's say they're fleeing and they flee into a church. It's like yeah. but you but the oh, enemies yeah. will respect the fact that they can't blow up the church or like siege it. Yeah, you know, World War Two it didn't happen. You bombed everything, well, including churches end. and yeah, stuff. That was right, the end but. Of it. But it's because, uh, you know, a, a recognition that this is the part of what you're arguing, you know, the common good of the whole is somehow represented in the church to such a degree yeah. that to run to the church is really to reconcile yourself to the whole. <laughs> totally. And you can imagine within within war in Christendom, uh, Andrew brought this out really wonderfully in a talk he gave at our conference and that, that I hope we'll publish soon. But... Um, imagine you're an army warring within Christendom. So you're warring between people that agree that we should all be members of one body in Christ. So it, the, the fighting becomes rearticulated as, um, having the bounds of, of, of a common goal. Like you're fighting sort of like within members of a family, like you, you certainly fight. Um, but you fight, under that presumption. And so, yeah, so there's, yeah, there's, there's sanctuary for, which he calls a humane fighting, right? Where there are yeah. certain rules. So he used the example of the crossbow where yeah. they ban the crossbow church. Bans and it's the crossbow, because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the church did yeah. from warfare. And it, I mean, imagine such a time where you could ban, you know, a instrument of war, but you know, it's because it was, it was the rationale is at a distance and it has extreme lethality. So yeah. good Christian soldiers can't use crossbows. <laughs> yeah, because because to use them, like the very technology itself can can only treat the, your the the Christian who you're warring with as someone for whom reconciliation is not possible. Like they're dead before you even arrive to talk to them. Whereas within the medieval form prior to this, um, ransom was always possible, surrender was always possible. Like if you're fighting a guy with a sword and he says take me, take me as captive. Uh, That was respected. Mm. It was respected to the point that I I, I didn't even realize it because you watch so many movies where it's just like, well, it's a melee, right? And they got swords. So they're just like dead, 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 stab, crush. (laughs) Uh, But no, actually it was a lot of like, Hey, let's work out a deal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, And Luther of all people cued me into this at first because when he's critiquing the Teutonic orders, I said, was it Luther? Oh man. 
Oh yeah, Luther addressed the Teutonic order. I don't know. If that I, was what I forget if of. it was. Oh, but, I shouldn't do this on podcast. It's terrible because it might have been a pope. Uh, you hate to get Luther, and the, <laughs> Luther and the, pope, the pope mixed yeah. up. Anyways, there's a critique of uh, of the knights for being cowardly, essentially because of this. That's like, oh, like you say you're all this, and you say you're really strong, but really you go out into battle, and you know that you can just offer you know offer a ransom for your life. So there was a mis- there's an understanding of that as being like common knowledge. Like everyone knows that the knights are able at any point to put this strict bound on the threat of death and violence um take me prisoner we'll pay you yeah (laughs) totally but like the fact that that was respected uh is evidence of an order in which war is couched within a greater peace whereas um the kind of anthropological presumption of liberalism is that war is total Mm -hmm. and bombing churches as opposed to having them as places of sanctuary is simply a result of this of this change. I mean, like when the nations of Europe went to war with each other in the world wars, they weren't fighting within a Christendom. They weren't fighting within a presumed common peace that you could say, look, despite, I mean, there were some moments, right? Those beautiful moments, like playing playing soccer with the Germans and the Brits on, on um, Christmas. You know, there's, there's these like brief moments of what we would describe as, wow, humanity, like the humane is present but but largely that that was that was the last that mm-hmm. was the last of it i think there's a feedback loop with the technology and i think jones pointed that out in you know world war one but like you don't invent virginia class nuclear submarines <laughs> for humane warfare like yeah. it's almost you make a nuclear submarine you think you know uh like the only express purpose can just be blowing up an entire city you know like there's and once you have all these technologies we can't even imagine really humane warfare anymore yeah like because that just and then and then there's a fear-based motive because it's like well if we don't develop virginia class nuclear submarines maybe the chinese will and then and then it's just this one big and and andrew described also posturing Mm. where in warfare you you might a king might bring an army to a border a border and then what was presumed is that another army you know that concessions would need to be made like it was just a posture it was just them saying hey we might yeah. we might do something to you so let's come to the the table and diplomatically decide yeah, that yeah stick out your chest stick out your chest yeah, like totally i got the hands up now what are you going to do but in world war 1 it was so mechanized that it was like, oh, they mobilize, time to mobilize, drop the bombs, start going. Yeah, you know? right, right. So with all of the technologies of standing armies, of militarized everything, um, the whole humane world of conflict seems to be completely absent. It's something that we can't even really imagine. Yeah, and I think it also, I don't know if, I don't want to like put a flag in like which part of our technological development really did it in but there's just no authority to leadership now once you dare to speak of like winnable nuclear wars where it's like to have nuclear weapons and to be willing to fight other countries with nuclear weapons is simply to say that the that this is like the idea that you can say this is for our good is um absurd it's Mm -hmm. like no, there's no one who wins. Um, and so we can't, yeah, the, the, we can't have a, um, yeah, I just don't think you can have a nuclear power uh, as your as your leader and not have some inkling that that power is willing to kill you. Like the people who lead you are willing at some level to engage in world-destroying warfare and like uh that at least makes it clear that what we have is not authority above us like which is by definition standing for the good for our good but because standing for the good um and that's not what we have we have like managers of of power machines Mm -hmm. Hmm. so sanctuary ain't gonna happen uh if if uh, you'd like to give it a try, if you're a priest out there, I would love to hear your experiences uh, of reinstituting the time honored tradition of sanctuary. The the one other thing before we move on, I'd want to mention is that I didn't really say this in the essay, so maybe this can be somewhat helpful. But I think that 
as with most things, it's not like there's this before and after Christianity. It's rather that the Christian form remains present, but it's usually much more embattled within liberalism than it is um, prior to liberalism. And so it's similar with sanctuary. It's not like there's no such thing. It's just that we tend to view it with such great skepticism. I mean, wherever someone protects someone from the technicality of the law, from the technicality of punishment by virtue of a certain personal relationship, by virtue of a personal understanding. I think you have the basic form of, of sanctuary, which I describe in the essay as a form of maternal power. Um, so like when a cop lets you off, not because you didn't technically break the law, not because there isn't technically a punishment due to you, but because he knows you and he's willing to listen to your circumstance and he makes a just prudential call to leave you alone because you're not a you're not a big problem. Mm-hmm. That is a sort that is a form of sanctuary. Like you are receiving uh, mercy that you don't deserve, but on the other hand, that you really do deserve because the police officer, at least on the ground, can understand the good of the community that he protects. Like he doesn't have to be a robot. He can say he can say, okay, but what am I doing here? Well, I'm trying to make sure everyone's at peace. And so, yeah, you know, your tail lights out, but I'm not going to give you a hard time because you're not. You know, whatever it is, mm-hmm. you're not really disrupting the peace here, which leads to this weird scenario, especially within liberalism, where, you know, that becomes so suspect as like bias, as, you know, nepotism, as basically not having a quality before the law. But it's also, I think, very Christian, right, to say, OK, what's the. What's the purpose of the law? Why do we put this in place? Why do we have this great regime of, of punishment and reward? Well, on the ground, you can determine it and say, well, it's because Third Street needs to be a safe place to, to walk with your family and you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Like you can determine a definite end to policing, punishment, and all that. You know, like when you show up, well, anyways, I'm not going to go th- through all my, my legal uh, getting... <laughs> But, it, but it speaks to <laughs> it speaks to the reality of all of those things be or, being oriented to the common good that you don't just receive the parking ticket every time. Yeah, like it's because there is a notion of the common good there that is trying to serve, that law is trying to serve, yeah. that punishment is trying to serve, and in the Christian context, which you know you draw, it's just so cool that that's that's what they saw the church as playing a major role in mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. as giving people sanctuary and uh, lessening the punishment because it's a recognition that they already are starting to be incorporated into the common good. Yeah. It's not just a carte blanche, like you roll up at the church and now you're free of all your crimes, but yeah. that yeah. you've achieved what you argue, you've achieved the, you've already begun to achieve the end of which punishment will get you to. Yeah. You know, and this keeps coming back to that idea that just having a definite end makes certain forms of politics possible that are just unimaginable to us. Just by saying, like, no, it's not all indefinite. We can actually determine what the good is here. We can actually say, like, simply having those definite purposes to life, um, yeah, they just enable human beings to act in ways that are really unimaginable to us. Um, and Sanctuary, I think it's just one of those ways. Um, there is a great essay um, and probably the most factual essay we've ever published <laughs> by Grant Martzolf, uh, Genealogy of American Insurance. You've often heard it. Um, well, maybe you've heard here that we are skeptical of insurance as a model for um uh, risk reduction um, and for taking care of each other. And this is sort of extrinsically obvious in the immense wealth of insurance companies that um, create all sorts of problems in our society from cost of basic services and medicine to um, just a, a lack of trust or the ability to gain off of any uh, uh, anything bad that happens to you. So they create many problems as everyone's aware of. Uh, They also take all your money and put it in the stock market and then get some sweet gains uh, as a result. But what Grant does here 
as he shows the way that a really very humane practice of sharing risks um, in a community became scraped, as it were, of the of the value there for um, becoming the the great industrial insurance complex that we that we currently live under. Mm-hmm. So I learned a lot. He also comes out uh, and talks about the the switch um, to healthcare sharing ministries, uh, which we're all a part of here, uh, New Polity at the College of St. Joseph the Worker, um, where essentially it's attempting to go back to an older model, but at the scale of insurance. Um, so it's sort of an untested uh, technique, uh, but you know, we basically receive other people's hospital bills and then send money to pay for what what they need or what mm. they what they need, have had, uh, whether medicine or for birth or something like that. Um, and this is a you know big group of people who are all involved in this direct, um, right? And I think he did a good job of it's not an advertisement forum and it's also not. Yeah. like a total critique of them. No. Like there are, it's kind of, I mean, to, to tackle the whole modern American healthcare industry is a, is a, is a dark water you're going to be in. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's, it's really nice that he, you know, I learned a lot about what they actually do, how they operate and um, healthcare sharing ministries that is. And he says there's still a lot of room for improvement for them. There's still, there's things that they're doing right that are returning to an older model. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I found it very interesting. Very, very. He gives a a, a ton of um, you know historical. Yeah. Um, how it's gone, things that have gone wrong, stuff like that. So. Yep. Yep. So he says uh, towards the end there that uh, healthcare sharing ministries um, should not be thought of as cheap forms of health health insurance. They are instead grounded in an alt in an alternative logic about risk mitigation, healthcare, and the purposes of social assistance. In this way, they should be thought of as being closer to the mutual aid and friendly societies of the late 19th century. That seems to be about right. So we enjoyed that. The Doherty's, uh, dear sweet Doherty's, um, published a article that they had presented at a new polity conference and then edited for the magazine. Uh, And it has the basic claim that um that we should all farm (laughs) i don't think that's actually what it is this this one caused some controversy at the office here um but they are basically arguing that there's things that human people really ought to do for their own development and they include the care of the earth as part of it and not just as a sort of um, specialized job that you might have a particular calling to. Now this is obviously taken just on the face of it can lead to, I think quite, quite rightly the critique of uh, sort of universalizing the particular, like the thing that's good for me is good for everyone, Mm -hmm. which is uh, seems to be the form of most like, philosophy uh these days is just like (laughs) i need to write on it at some point but yeah i mean i I was reading nietzsche the other day in beyond good and evil this is besides the 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 paper where he's talking about every philosophy seems to me a kind of personal confession of its originator and a kind of unconscious memoir and it's like man i see that in myself too where it's like it's it's hard for a philosopher to i mean you 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 inevitably in your writing and when you're thinking you end up bringing out what you already think is the good. And so you're kind of importing yeah, your own yeah, yeah. kind of experience and stuff. Um, it can happen. Uh, and we, I, we also just want to justify our lives and that's not a bad mm-hmm. thing. It's like our lives are supposed to be justifiable. And so often the project is, I mean, even in Nietzsche's day he points this out where like, um, you know, Aristotelianism justifies Aristotle's life. Yeah. Uh, it's an aristocratic uh, yeah. mode of life. <laughs> right. <It's>, yeah. <laughs> the word comes later, but yeah. Uh, and, and the, and that's true today. I just think that there's a, um, there's a deeper temptation uh, now because there's a premium on having a justifiable life uh, that's established through the power of posting online. It's like the, the whole uh, mechanism of social media is designed to get us to craft little, 
justifications for why we are something good. We take a picture of ourselves doing something and say, I've done it, I've achieved the good life. And then people can they can like it. Like <laughs> it. Yeah, and, and so and this this increase, unfortunately, I don't think it's like I don't think it's that bad yet, but unfortunately it's increasingly associated not with just like psychological relief, but real power in the world. Like if you can actually have what appears to be a justifiable life posted well online, then you can turn that into money. You know, Mm -hmm. it's tempting. It it is. Yeah. I'm lucky that my life is so just disgusting that (laughs) (laughs) it's hard to write, you know, (laughs) same here. It's like hard to recommend it. Just, there was a a point they made about, uh, you know, between in, in modern farming where it, they set an opposition between biomimicry and yeah, force. That's right, that's right. And it's this, um, what, what was really cool is it's the idea that nature is something to, we're forcing the the food out of it. Like yeah, we are, yeah, we are, yeah. we are using tons of chemicals. We're using machines to um, produce the largest yield. It doesn't really matter if it's quality or if it's really natural at all. If you're or really, it doesn't matter what its relationship to the dense ecosystem that it's embedded in is. It's like yeah. corn is a plant whose singular goal is the eating corn, and it has no relation to soil and it doesn't have mm-hmm. relation to to grazing animals. It's just I mean, yeah, and we, I, I saw an example the other day. It's actually day. more related to fuel, but yeah, like in northern Illinois, I think in the 50s or something, the army needed to clear out all this algae in the, one of the rivers that leads into the Great Lakes. So they brought in Asian carp, and Asian carp is an invasive, invasive species, and it basically killed all of the other fish. And it got so bad that they didn't want it to get into the Great Lakes. So the Army Corps of Engineers built an electric electrified fence <laughs> that if the carp swim up towards the great lakes it like electrifies them and they have to swim back and it cost a ton of money to keep the electricity going and right. build this whole thing so it, it really honed in on this force aspect yeah, it's yeah. like when you use force against nature and you try to to conquer it and all this stuff you end up inventing tons and tons of new problems i mean you yeah. know whatever like the dust bowl in the 30s or something yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, from farming so it's not just that like oh we shouldn't use force but that things are going to go really badly when you do use force and you don't use biomimicry and when you only i mean to say something that respects nature means that there's a life that precedes you it's particular and it has its own perfection like it has uh you know like an an oak tree has a a a perfection as its oak tree that you can take away from um or you can contribute to and the theological vision of man that begins in Genesis, but it's, you know, right shot through the Judaic and Christian tradition is that man is a principle of perfection in the cosmos in relation to everything that's below him. So we don't exist in a static relationship where, um, you know, we just receive nature as it is. And Doherty's bringing this out really well. We exist in a dynamic relationship of perfection. So we see what ends the different creatures have and then we try to help them to attain their ends and even elevate their ends beyond themselves um so we kind of serve as it were as grace to um the creatures below us and even as we are being literally brought up into a perfection beyond uh our nature by what's above us Mm -hmm. god um and this means that there's never a uh, within this within this sort of view, um, what they describe as biomimicry makes a good deal of sense because you're basically saying, okay, first I affirm that there is something good here that God has wrought, and that what I do is not contrary to it, but must be elevating it. So. The imitation of natural patterns, which they describe, especially by like the rotation of animals that mimics the way grazing herds would naturally uh, move, etc. Uh, these aren't like a certain slavishness to the existing natural order. Um, they are recognition that if it's there, it's good. And so what we do is not work against it, but work to elevate it to to higher possibilities, um, ultimately to serve the church, ultimately to serve the life of man and life of prayer. And 
what I think happens here is that in this essay, there's a, um, I think they quite rightly intuit that there's a problem in our modern era that involves essentially divorce. Like you take something and then you split it up into parts and you select some one particular part as if it is its nature and you ignore the rest. And this, we do this to people and we do this to plants and we do this to animals. It's a very, you know, it has its deep roots, uh, in, in, uh, Baconian science and a few other places. Yeah, mechanistically. Yeah, the mechanistic, mechanistic view of nature, which ironically parallels more with the pagan view of nature. Um, and like in the Homeric age of the Greeks, where the crops are understood as being hidden from man in the ground and farming is understood to be a certain like resting of food out of the world from, from the gods. Um, similar kind of idea where where farming comes in the language and the guise of mining. Like mm. we're going to raise meat <laughs> or something like that instead <laughs> of raising like a particular form of animal, like a sheep or something. Um, but the, the, the point that I find to be um, challenging here is that there's something about a relationship to the land that has, has a sort of universality to it. So obviously if I were to sit here and say, Hey, you know what I am? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a podcaster and that's the form of life. That is the good life. And everyone should be like me, a podcaster. Everyone would, would, I would hope laugh at it because it's ridiculous. It's obviously ridiculous. The problem with saying the same thing about farming. And the reason I think it really like strikes us as, I don't know, a little invasive is that there is something universal about the land uh, and, and our dependence on it that is easily mistaken for that, I think, universalizing of just a specialty. Mm -hmm. Like, it is true that we all must eat or we die. Yep. It's not true that we have to podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you won't die if we don't put this out. You won't yeah. die. And you won't die if you don't invest in the stock market. But... You will die if you don't eat. And so because of this, the um, raising of food is not something that we can have a relationship. And this is sort of brought out through the whole essay. It's not something that we can simply have the relationship of like, well, that's a specialty for someone else. Um, it's not to say that everyone has to farm at all. It's like that would be that rather it's to say that in what we do, we always have to have the humility that at some level it's precisely farming is precisely growing food that is enabling us to do whatever it is that we do. Um, there's simply no way around that. It's when God gives the garden to, to Adam and, and part of his commission is to till and to keep the garden. Um, it's not like he's giving Adam just some niche activity that's going to work great for Adam. Um, but it is rather something I think that all the things we do need, need to realize that we come from the ground. Um, and I don't mean just simply like thank a farmer or something like that. Um, but really we should, we should ask if our work is meaningful. Like if it serves higher goods to such an extent that we can justifiably say, I'm not raising food from the ground. I, I think this is, people often I think have this intuition when they're in really crappy jobs because what do they do? They start to pine for this life of, you know, and it's mm -hmm. very naive, oh, yeah, but totally. they're like, yeah, maybe I could just leave it all behind and go homestead. Something mm -hmm. like that. It's often very related to the crappy job, but I want to affirm that romanticism. It's not just, they're, they're not just being, um, you know, sentimental. I think there's a real sense that when you're doing something that you know is is sort of useless, like it makes money and the money is has utility, but that's it. You're in the same relationship as farming already, which is basically do something in order to get food in order to continue to live. The wage system actually universalizes the agricultural condition of man. It makes everyone a peasant in a weird way because it takes what's true of someone raising food, which is that they're working to eat to consume in order to fall asleep and then to wake up and to do it again, uh, without like, that's, that's an animal reality that's serving the body that has a, that has a, um, a kind of circular logic to it. 
well, when you're doing the same thing by like inputting th data points into a spreadsheet and when you justify what you're doing on the basis of it makes money, then you are essentially farming as it were, but, but without the land because mm. you're just making the money in order to consume, in order to live, to have enough energy to do it again and so forth. Yep. And so I think that there is a, uh, and, I, and so I think that should be a real challenge to people, like to look at your life and ask, well, if if that's what you're doing, well, <laughs> why are you doing it? Why do? Why not? Just Dude, there's a, a a thing you say often, but it's so true. Like, do what makes you happy. Oh, yeah. Like, I, yeah, you've mentioned this a few. You mentioned it at the con, uh, the ISI conference and 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 last time, but it, it's like, is this making you miserable? Yeah. Well, maybe something should change. Yeah. You know, yeah. like now, I I think the the romanticism about like. You know, I'll just leave everything behind yes, and yes. you know go out into nature and all this stuff. Many is things. is usually imprudent, but totally you you at least can and and hear that there's a universality or a real deep importance to farming and being close to the land. It made me think also about like harvest harvest festivals yeah. or a celebration of uh and it's also deeply religious. It's thankfulness to God for providing the crops, yeah. for providing the food. But you know, if you're grabbing a slice of pizza in New York city or something like that. Like you're so far removed from now. It doesn't mean everyone needs to move out of New York. They need to move out for other reasons, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, there's, um, there's a, uh, you know, especially with like globalized agriculture as well. Like the meat comes from Brazil and then, yeah. you know, all these other things, um, at, at the least they're, they're saying there's a, um, there's a connection to food that is deeply important. <laughs> and we need to be emphasizing that. Yeah. Um, they are the real deal. And they definitely uh, provide us with the challenge of thinking about things that are not simply shiftable onto other people in order for us to do something better. They use the example of parenting. And I, and I think that's quite right. I think we can often have an idea. There's a, there's a rabbi in oh man i'm gonna totally forget the citation but he, he says every time the jews get into trouble it's because they have left agriculture far behind and i think that that lack of rudeness the idea that there's certain acts that in themselves acknowledge our dependence on the given created order uh that removing ourselves from them whether actually by just saying like well this is just for the tiniest sliver of the population to do to feed the rest or spiritually where we simply do not acknowledge that as our ultimate source of animal life of, of dependence here um it it just leads to stupidity like to just thinking you're you're all that that you're a god that you that you don't fundamentally come out of people meeting your needs and being um, welcoming you into life and keeping you in life um all right so doherty's and and oh sorry thank you that's the it's a man who knows the editing he has to do later um then we had a debate i debated with mr caleb estep i've actually never said his last name aloud i nope. hope you pronounced that right and you know what the debate's about. It's the one that, it's just always about the stock market. You know, I try to say lots of controversial things. <laughs> just trying to, you know, get a, get something out of people. You know, I want to, yeah. I want to argue. I love arguing. It's like, it's so fun. You're hitting them in their portfolio. It's just the know? portfolio. It's the only thing that we get, um, get people riled up about. I'll keep trying. I'll keep trying to rile up everyone with other things. But for now. Um, Caleb's great. He did a he did a really great job um, leveling a few arguments against um, the case against blind investing we made, the case against stock uh, ownership or stock holding generally, um, and yeah. Since I wrote it, you should probably say something about it. So I don't oh just sure. Start to <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as this line, you know, uh, while large companies might not serve the common good in the most effective or community friendly manner possible, nevertheless, it seems obvious that they do build up society in their own way. So he's arguing, oh, yeah, okay, well, you right. guys, you guys are, you know, saying you, you can invest in Apple and Microsoft and Google because they, 
utilize slave labor and which they do and are you know hurting things and you shouldn't invest in them but it's this kind of remote cooperation with evil Mm -hmm. it's like well you know they they do all these bad things but you know it you're still you still maintain some type of distance yeah now you address this by saying that the, the argument is not uh this remote participation in evil it's there's no necessity like you, you don't actually have to get the ten to fifteen percent annualized return every year to live. Mm-hmm. And you use yourself as, a, as an example. I use myself as an example. Yeah. Like, like, still uh, alive. Yeah, there. And like, what is the necessity of having to have these returns? Um, you could, yeah. you could start. Now there is a kind of argument where, and I, I could kind of see this where. The U.S. government is inflating the currency at a massive rate, and it has been for a very long time. COVID was an enormous time of that. Most of those inflated dollars go into the stock market. They go to companies. Mm-hmm. Like companies went, it, the stock market tanked. You know, SPY went down to 200, and now it's back up. Now it's up at like 500 something. So if you're not being invested in the stock market, basically all of your assets are being depreciated. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, there's like a fear necessity there. It's still not actual necessity to participate in it. Um, but he didn't make that argument, but I could see that being made. Yeah. And uh, uh, that get, that might get it too complicated because it's like, yeah, actually, the government over the last four years has depreciated every one of your assets massively, you know, through through inflation and interest. But w- what you point out, you know, you, you make the example of uh, slaves are us, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. and the grocery store, which. Well, it's just that this this idea of remote participation in evil especially in America. I don't know how it is in other countries, but unfortunately, and I'm sure someone else has the sort of genealogy of how this came to be, but unfortunately it's come to be this idea that there are just like static things that are evil in which we can remotely participate. Um, But the principle is, is like, as you say, it's, it's in relationship to some necessity. So I tried to simplify with an example, which is that if the, if the only grocery store in your town is run by slavers, um, slaves are us, then yes, you have the principle by which you can say, I'm going to participate in this evil um, because there is a good here, right? Providing groceries is a good. I'm not, and then you can make all the arguments that are associated with this sort of participation where you're saying like, I, I'm not, participating in it for the purpose of slavery, but for the purpose of providing food for my family, et cetera, et cetera. And that all checks out so long as there's no other option, right? But the moment that there's someone else, there's some grocery store that isn't run by slavers, uh, then you do become, I mean, obviously liable for choosing one versus the other. And this is why when it comes to companies and it comes to not just companies, but our whole financialized state, when we say um, I can justifiably get a return and ultimately get a retirement by promoting the market value of Amazon and Google and everyone else within the portfolio, um, even though they do these bad things, you're only really justified in that argument if you are saying that you must and that there is another options. Um, and there can be like, prudential determinants about what makes something a reasonable option, right? Like if, uh, like cars, I think is an an example I use where, you know, you can, you can think about cars and say, well, they've done a lot of damage to the world. They kill a lot of people every year. In fact, it's the number one way that most teenagers die is in automobiles. But to say, uh, and therefore I can't participate in it. I will not have a car basically involves the immediate loss of goods that are necessary to a person who has the basic goals of living, raising a family, mm-hmm. you know, or just getting to church, for instance. And so you can justifiably say, look, maybe this is an evil, but I'm going to participate in it. Um, but, but you see how necessity is actually the, the governing condition of, of the justification for our Totally. And I, in I think evil. Caleb's objection actually really clarifies your position because I think some people can can just say, oh, well, they don't like the stock market because they think investing in these companies, they're bad companies. Right. But yeah. 
in the article, I think you guys attack, you know, Catholic mutual funds as well. And it's it's not just investing in the right stuff in the stock market, yeah. but you're saying there's something essential to the stock market that is, um, especially with the secondary market. Yeah. So the idea that you're not investing unless it's an IPO and it, it, like in the company, you're yeah. actually just buying the shares of ownership from other people. Yeah. And because you're doing that, it's not just like, oh, I'm forced to do this remote cooperation with evil. It's that the whole structure of the stock market ex- itself is something you should avoid. Yeah. Right. It's not just find the right companies, you know. Yeah. And that that was I'm so grateful for Caleb because it, it gave me some time to really think about this. I titled the my response to him, someone somewhere screwed. And, you know, poor Jacob and mom, he'd spend so much time trying to explain things to me, but financial language has this way of just dissolving like right between my ear and my brain. Um, but I felt like I could really think about this more clearly and, and maybe this will be helpful to others that the problem with stock markets is somebody gets screwed by them eventually. And this should be really obvious because what we're doing is buying high, buying low and selling high. Right? I do so, the opposite, but no. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Jesus does. <laughs> so, so you know, if I, because it has this relationship to companies by which a stock has uh, has value, but as I think we all know now, maybe not, the relationship to a company's profits to its success is not something essential to a stock price. Like, there's ways of inflating it through marketing. There's ways of inflating it through buybacks. There's ways of inflating it through just decision. Uh, we always use GameStop as an example. Um, so it has a sort of extrinsic connection to company success, but doesn't doesn't necessarily. So, so what we're really doing fundamentally is saying, I'm going to give you this piece of paper, and um, uh, for ten dollars, but I think that you can find someone who will buy it for eleven dollars. That's the that's the principle. Um, now, what makes that paper appear valuable does come from all sorts of places. Like I'm not denying that. I'm not saying that it's it's literally buying low and selling high on a piece of paper. But the but the point is that the mechanism the, by which it, anyone does it at all is just buying low and selling high. It has no particular content to it beyond mm. that. And the problem with that is eventually um, someone gets screwed. Totally. Because what it does is, you know, okay, sure, you, you find someone who will buy it for $11 and you make a sale. And then that person finds someone who will buy it for 12 and then 13 and 14 But given enough time, eventually it arrives to the point where someone is unable to find a buyer for what he has bought for a higher price. So then he takes the, he takes the hit. Yep. Um, this is a logical necessity, I think, actually. Uh, like, you know, there's a finite amount of wealth in mm-hmm. on Earth. And so if if it were always possible that to make a just trade by which, because this is part of the argument, it's part of Caleb's argument, and we've heard it uh, many other places before, where basically you say, okay, yeah, this is how the stock market operates, where you're always giving the stock to someone that you think... Um, you're always selling it at a time where you think it won't go up further, but it's not unjust to do so. You're not like pawning off a lemon on some other guy because you're making a just exchange. So the guy who buys the stock wants to have the potential earning from the stock. He wants that long-term growth. He wants he wants something that um, will give him security over time, whereas you want cash now, probably because you want to buy something in particular. So you're exchanging sort of kinds of power almost like, all right, I'll exchange a little bit of ready cash or, or a little bit of long-term investment power for a little bit of ready cash and you shake on it. And that's true. I mean, that, that, that checks out, that can be an equitable exchange, but, um, it relies though on at some point an exchange happening where that, uh, guy who's selling for ready cash gets it, but the guy does not get, uh, the long-term investment mm-hmm. because yeah and most i mean and so well, the reason yeah, i say ahead, that well ahead. first of all the reason i say that's logically impossible mm-hmm. is because it would rely on being of on an infinite um capacity for this for stock growth which shouldn't surprise us like the whole premise of the modern company is infinite growth the whole premise of the stock market is infinite growth um but 
if we think about what that actually means, if a stock price always has to increase um, so that it benefits the next person, the next person, then just you, you run out of the world. Like at some point you have a- Oh yeah, right, at a, some point. An infinite stock price cannot be purchased by a finite amount of wealth. Mm -hmm. So someone's going to buy it at a time when it's going to dip. Which which we don't necessarily see because we don't think of that as that is what stock market crashes are. Um, that is also what devaluation of goods and services and, and, and real assets is, which is an effect of investing in the stock market, which we describe a little in here. I mean, like if, if because we have the stock market, it enables a guy who can, you know, manipulate st stock buyback mechanisms to end up with $2 billion in cash which does happen, mm -hmm. and then he uses that cash to buy up property, all of a sudden you, who might have made 10% on what you put into the stock market, look around and you can't afford a house. So that's a way of getting screwed. <laughs> totally. I, I think there's even, I mean, it's not like a proof, but like a phenomenological argument. Every time, it, it doesn't matter what of the instruments you're using, you're buying the stock from someone else because you think it's going to go up while the other person thinks it's going to go down. You're selling a stock because you think this actually isn't worth what it's currently being valued at and someone else will, will be the sucker who takes takes it from you. You're short selling because you're, you know, you think the stock price is going to go down and the guy who buys it is going to have to sell it at a lower price at a later date. You're buying a call option and you're buying and the the person who sells you the contract on the option thinks that you're an idiot because it's not going to go up by that amount within that time frame you're selling a put option you know either on the writer or the guy who buys the contract like every single one of the interactions phenomenologically is i desire the other person's loss <laughs> like the whole I, yeah. and and that, that's, that's just the flip side of i desire like it's one of the very it's so hyper intense where it's like i I actually want the part of me winning is this guy loses sure. like every single time you're making a purchase. That's the real fun of it. I mean, this is this is what <laughs> bugs me about. I probably talked about this before. This this feels like getting into a, a, a rant or a rut. But it, what what I find difficult about the Catholic apology for the stock market is that the one thing that's obviously fun about the stock market is the thing they have to deny is existing. It's like, OK, so you're telling me that when you trade stocks, you're just out there making equitable exchanges. Like, no, you're not. You're winning. <laughs> you're, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're, yeah. you're out there you know, winning. You know, like the Matthew McConaughey speech in uh, Wolf of Wall Street? No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like, yeah, you know, screw the customer. Like, we're here to take home cash. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like trying to win. You know, and that's, that's, obviously, what is, that's what's actually fun about that's it. That's the joy and the fun of it. And then the, and the, uh, it's like the, the gambling, the competition, the night out at the casino, the like showing your boys what just went up and then like despairing with your boys when it goes down. I mean, that's like it, it's parasitic latch onto just masculine, um, uh, agony is, mm. is where the, where the fun is. Yeah. And then, so when a Catholic has a certain, uh, when he's confronted by a certain moral problem with it, you, you have to re-describe all of that and pretend none of that is the really motivating factor. Or oh, if it yeah. is, it's still okay because fundamentally I can think of a possible situation in which you and I meet and I know what you want. Oh, you want long-term investing power? That's great because what I want is ready cash. Yeah. So yeah. I think we could work out a deal here that works well for both parties. So that situation, which never happens, becomes the kind of theoretical justification for all the situations that really do happen, which is like push by. Yeah. They make it like Ned Flanders of the 401k is the stock market or something. Right, right, right. It's like, right. no, it's not. <laughs> it's definitely not that. But I think that, I think it's nevertheless important to argue against on that basis. So I think you're, so what I'm saying is I think you're totally right about the actual, just first person experience of, of stock trading. Um, but I think that even if the argument for it is so detached from um, what people actually experience, so even if the argument is that you're basically regulating prices, uh, but which is its own argument, because regulating prices through the means of gaining just means that the right price is the one that allows someone to gain through the stock market mechanism. So it's it's a circular little bit of logic. But the point is, that it, if you want to describe it as this act of justice, essentially, 
which is the right impulse because if you can't describe it as an act of justice then you shouldn't be doing it. that's fair uh i think it's still worth pointing out that even there it, it doesn't work because if it's true if you uh, and i concede that it could be true it could be possible to to have exactly the situation described of an equitable an equitable exchange of this for that um Nevertheless, it is only possible as an exchange insofar as someone eventually gets screwed by it. Um, the If it wasn't the case, then the very ability to use stocks would never have come into existence in the first place. Like there has to be that like infinite growth at some point has to mm-hmm. fail to meet our finite natures. It's just the way it is. I mean, I, and I think in the essay, I describe like what would Aquinas say if I were to explain the stock mechanism to me? I think he would say something like, well, you're not really trading anything here. Um, but mm-hmm. anyway, so I don't, I don't want to have, have the debate because it seems unfair. I don't have the opponent in the room. Right. But you were telling me about, uh, Oh, payment for order flow. Do you want yeah. to go into that? Okay. I just want you to explain it to the people because oh, sure. that was With all news to me. Yeah. So, you know, most people know what Robinhood, the the app is. <clears throat> we This this was prompted because we had an email discussing the stock market article you and Jacob had wrote, written. And the guy was saying, hey, I was a stock trader for years. There's a lot of things you guys are that you could additionally critique that you're not you're not discussing. And one which I've looked into with Robinhood is is uh, so Robinhood is a broker, and a broker holds on to shares and purchases shares on behalf of a buyer. So you can download Robinhood and you can sign up for a trading account. You start buying stocks. You can also buy options. Uh, and Robinhood basically invented not completely invented. I don't know the whole history of who started it, but zero percent commission trading in which you could buy 100 shares of Apple and not pay any commission to the broker. And everyone was wondering like, well, how does Robinhood actually make money if they're just the middleman for buying stocks? Well, they had a, there's another company called, in Robinhood's example, Citadel, who's a market maker. And the market maker uh, is the one that goes and buys the shares. And what, what happens is, let's say they get 1,000 shares of Apple that they need to buy because they got 1,000 customers, each one and one share of Apple. So Robinhood, the broker, will uh, send the order flow or the, the asks for the stock to Citadel, the market maker, who then takes it to the open market. And because they have such a large amount of orders, what Citadel does as a market maker is uh, because they own the stock, they own or they're holding on to the stock, they can short the stock a thousand shares. So short selling, meaning you sell ownership of the stock to buy it back at a later date. And because they short a stock, the bid ask spread, or basically how much money it would cost to buy the stock, how much, uh, or, or how much people are asking for a certain share versus how much it's being commonly, you know, wanted to be, uh, wanting to be bought for the bid ask spread moves down a very, very, very small amount. And so they short, let's say, a thousand shares of Apple, and then immediately buy it back at a lower, at a lower uh, bid ask. You take, know. take the difference, and then they take part of the difference as profit, and they pay Robinhood some of that money for uh, the order flow because Robinhood yeah. is the one actually getting people to invest. Yeah. And so actually a lot of the other brokerages have shifted to a 0% commission model and have different companies like Citadel, other market makers that will pay them for order flow. Now, the thing that we were discussing, and I think it's very important here is this explains why Robinhood's whole model is get as many people as possible to start stock investing, Mm. to download Robinhood and you're 18 years old and you're buying shares or... There's others like Acorns, uh, TD Ameritrade's done a lot of, um, you know, trying to get more people to 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 not have a mutual fund who takes your money and invests for you, but you yourself who are choosing stocks. Yeah, which is always very dangerous. I mean, do you really have enough information to know what stock to choose or whatever? It's because the more people and more money they have flowing in through their app, the more money they're going to end up making yeah. as a brokerage. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, after COVID, I think you know, way more people were were investing with these type of brokers, way more money was flowing into the market. Yeah. Um, 
you even have stuff like Cash App or Venmo who are now offering cryptocurrency buying and stuff like that. Um, and so it's really accelerated the incorporation of not just like throw your money into a 401k, forget about it, throw your money into a mutual fund and forget about it, but like active day trading yeah. and active. Um, and the other thing they offered is basically options trading for everyone as well. And options are far more dangerous because <laughs> yeah. it's your there's two parties. One is a writer of a contract. The other is the buyer. The writer of the contract, track, let's just say it's a call option, puts a premium that is paid for the contract. Um, and the contract is, is, is basically on 100 shares of a stock and you set a price for the call or the put at a certain date. So let's say Apple's at $100. You buy a 101 Apple call with an expiration date of next week. And you pay a premium of, let's say, $50 to the person who writes the contract. So the person who writes the contract wants Apple to remain under $101. Because if so, he keeps the premium and he doesn't have to pay you anything. But if Apple goes to $102, then he has to pay you money because uh, the you, you, you basically bought the right to buy 100 shares of Apple the week after for one hundred and one dollars. Oh, so you're just betting. On... You're, you're betting on the price. Gotcha. Yeah. And it can be used a lot of different ways. Um, so put options are the opposite, where you're buying a contract to buy a stock at a lower price at a certain date uh, because you think actually the price is going to dip below that point. You can have in the money options. You can have out of the money options. So it's more risky to have out of the money call options. So let's say sounds the, like roulette. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, I mean like, it's it's all like it's all red, black. So odds, evens. you can have call options. Let's say Apple's at a hundred dollars, and you buy a ninety dollar call option. That means it's an in the money option, and if it goes up, you get a smaller percent return. But if you have a call option that's like way above the price, if it reaches that, you make a lot of money. So it's all this, um, but it gets really complicated. <laughs> but they're offering it to like you know random people it's like yeah you can option trade with the big boys yeah, yeah, you know yeah. and yeah. uh start having iron condor uh, you know uh call put spread in between and and all these different mechanisms you can buy puts and then actually buy shares and then you can short and it's just like we're it's incorporating everyone into to the gambling of the wall street execs yeah. you know yeah um I don't know if that had a definite point to it, but, <laughs> no, I'm learning but that's a lot. the... So, well, I think, so, I think yeah. the, the overall... I mean, there's there's two things. One is that, that really helps to explain why there's not just like a sort of liberatory incentive to get tons of people to invest in the stock market. There's just a definite financial incentive for the people who are running basically the, the technologies of investing to get many people in, which is that... I mean, that probably was always the case to a certain mm-hmm. extent, but it's like at a maximum now and you guys saw that with the the 401k you know the initial it's like all this money that instead of being paid to salaries is now put in the market and it has a massive effect and i think payment for order flow could be that too or already has been yeah yeah no i mean that it's it's like you said earlier the technologies have this sort of um feedback loop relationship with our motivations so it's like we make the technologies that we want to attain the goals we want which is obvious but then the technologies themselves set the kind of goals that we can imagine as as being really possible. And so what you have is the habituation of a culture to a particular form of life, ultimately, in and through the technologies they use. And so if if we're creating a nation of of day traders, uh, so be it. (laughs) But what you also show is um, um, that the stock market is really interesting because it's a game that everyone plays, but the rich win. Oh so, yeah, totally. And, and yeah. Because they have more power. So it, it and, and so much of modern life is like this, where you have some kind of neutral objective uh, arena for competition where everyone has a chance. And we recognize cynically that this isn't true. Like with politics, for instance, where it's like anyone can be the president. It just happens to be that it's from the same four or five families who have tons of money, 
but anyone could technically be president. <laughs> yep. Just need five billion dollars to get started on your campaign. Well, it's the same gambling problem. It's like you think you're going to beat the house, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like... So, so, but our society is predicated on this like ideological denial that power is real, and that okay, so we're all equal. We all have equal opportunities, and if we don't, that's a technical problem, and we can manage that out of existence to an ideal state in which power would be irrelevant because everyone kind of can have equality, not just of opportunity, but of, but of outcomes. Um, that's the logic that we pretend is real, but we all know in every instance that power matters, that who your family is matters, that it's not what you know, it's who you know, that you know, all these, so, so this, is, this is very similar to the gullibility and cynicism dialectic, right? Mm. Um, but within the stock market, it's just very obvious because if you have, say, a billion dollars, then you also have the kind of social influence you need to talk to the executives of companies who can manipulate their stock prices through various mechanisms like stock buybacks. And you can't, like other people can't. No, yeah. Right. And that's not a discrepancy of, of wit or cleverness even, it's a discrepancy of power. Like this person has different capacities than you. But by all playing in the stock market at any level, we essentially give those capacities to the very wealthy. It's like they can only manipulate a stock market insofar as there is a stock market. Yep. Uh, and so as it becomes more and more ubiquitous, um, we're gonna see the, I mean, it's already, it's not, I'm not predicting anything, I'm describing. Um, we'll just see the transfer of wealth to a class of financial elites who are leaps and bounds, like richer than, than everyone else. Like to talk about inco income equality, inequality at a certain point is, is, is silly. It's like, there's almost a qualitative distinction here. Like there's it's just getting way worse income. Yeah. And then this thing that they have, uh, mm. <laughs> which is power. There's a great clip of Robert Downey Jr. Like maybe 15 years ago when he visits, uh, the New York stock exchange and he's just like horrified of the whole thing. It's hilarious. Um, but, and he's just talking about how they're just greedy and says a few choice words with it. And it's, he has a great line, but he visits that and is like, this is a bunch of low lifes, greedy scumbags, basically. And the, you know, because when you see it on the trading floor, it's very obvious, but now we're just bringing that whole life of financial numbers and trading and stuff, and then making it a kind of common experience of your, you could be sitting in class and day trading, you know, yeah. in, in school, or you could be at your office and checking stocks all the time and stuff like that. And it's, it's not, I'm not saying that's like everyone's intention, but at its worst, at the highest levels of what this is going on at, at the highest stock, ex, you know, you know, power players and whales, um, it's, it's pure profit motive. And that, that has big ramifications that we should be aware of when that gets spread to everyone. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not like you can have this kind of neutral idea where you, you, um, you can just keep it at a distance, but still be investing it. It's shaping you in a certain way and you should be aware of that. Yeah. I also just grow depressed over the increasing uh, ability to fail at life. That seems to be endemic to modern society. It's like, at least before you had the app on your phone, you could slack a little and, and laugh at the rich guys because you don't really have the capacity. So you can say like, okay, but I, I don't concern myself with all that crap. I'm, you know, after a good life, it's simple. And that might be kind of reactionary and rude, but it was genuinely possible. But every time a technology, and it's just inevitable, becomes ubiquitous within society, what you lose is also the excuse for not using it. Mm -hmm. And so now it's like, and I see this in ads where they're like, why are you not investing in X options or whatever? Like, like you're missing out right now. It's like you become liable for, like, instead of a world in which your labor should get like a just return, you become liable for not being a clever day trader to get, you know, yeah. to get money. So you have just this like one more addition to your own inadequacy. Um, and that's the actual, it seems to be like what's going to be the actual result is that you're just going to maximize the dis dissatisfaction within a society um, by virtue of allowing everyone to play a game that's won by very few people. Mm -hmm. um, oh man, it's a, <clears throat> it's a massive tool of the wealthy to make its populace greedy. Like it, 
there's a reason why people buy lottery tickets and uh, people day trade and stuff like that. It's because they they want to be the 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 dude who beats the market and makes this amazing trade and can ride off into the sunset and this type of thing. Yeah. And um, and so it, it yeah this is why the analogy with gambling is very apt. It, you know it it you ha- you've posited some end that money will solve the other problems in your life and um it can it can lead to um it it involves you in something where the chances of you actually achieving that are very slim Mm -hmm. it's like hip-hop no i mean i mean it's it's like so so you start mass producing um music it becomes something that's increasingly devoid of uh like the ability to perform um but it becomes for a very select small number of people a way out of poverty and it's like it's a liberatory possibility mm-hmm. and so what you establish through through it um, not considered as actual music which can be great but as a form of life and i think hip-hop is obviously a form of life as much mm-hmm. as it's is this kind of incredible dissatisfaction um like you give everyone everyone the possibility all you need to do is be able to <laughs> sling a couple yeah. great bars just put it out on soundcloud and, and and that's it you get found and you get lifted up and and then all of this misery ceases and of course that's not what happens uh but everyone thinking that it happens be, like it's possible for them becomes a condition of possibility by which it does happen for some very like minuscule number of people who yeah. then have immense power dissatisfaction below is always like necessary for these kinds of great uh great um centralizations of power in in in, mm. in into, yeah, it's like gullibility cynicism thing again yeah YouTube's like this, you know. Yeah. That's why we're sticking to that one to three thousand views. Yeah, our, our six thousand subscribers are the best in the world. You they, know? they are fantastic. We desire nothing else. Mm. Um, actually, we would really desire that you just subscribe to the magazine. Then you don't Get have offline. to. You don't have to listen to this this stuff as we try to summarize it. Um, so, with that, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, New Poly Magazine, greatest magazine on earth comes out when it comes out and boy <laughs> i think it lands uh we're busy with our, our next issue and i'm really excited about some of the names that are uh, contributing to it so if you haven't subscribed yet please consider subscribing today um it will change your life for the better i think i think that that much is that much i can i can promise <laughs> alex it's been a pleasure oh it's been great all right we'll see you next time everybody